Hello and welcome to Heavy Metal Rex. My name is Oase, and today we're going to continue with episode 2 of Tuner Talk. You've already seen the thumbnail, and if you're a part of some of the Facebook groups, uh, that I, especially the ones that I'm at, you already know the name Drunk Man Tuning. Uh, this is Anthony, who has done just great work with a lot of our members and continues to do great work and will be able to tell us some more stuff about how he does this great work. Uh, now, the questions that we're going to be asking him are a combination of things that I came up with, but majority of them I've actually pulled from the comment section of the last Tuner Talk video. So keep those questions coming because I want this to be an open dialogue between uh, the tuner and, I guess, the tunees. So let's get started. Okay, guys, so I, I have Anthony here from Darkman Tuning, and I cannot wait to hear what he has. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Please tell us more about yourself. So I am D-Man Tuning, otherwise known as Drunk Man Tuning. It's not so politically correct anymore. So I've, as of late, been kind of changing my name to D-Man Tuning to make it more politically correct. Uh, I'm a cop pro tuner. I specialize in probably Subaru would be my, I guess, my bread and butter of most things. Um, I've been tuning. Hmm, I've been tuning since about 2006. I uh, became a cop pro tuner about 2009. It's just kind of been like a nonstop, never-ending process since then. So, wow, that's that's how how many Subarus do you think? Just completely random. How many Subarus do you think you've seen so far in your life? Uh, the first few years, to be honest, it was kind of like part time. Wasn't full time. I think I stopped counting around seven or eight thousand a couple years wow. ago. A couple of years ago, seven, eight thousand. Wow! So you're probably over the ten thousand mark by now. Probably in that range, something like that. Um, but you know, with tuning, you, you you ditch and go through so many different laptops. It's kind of hard. Oh. Uh, it's picked up on an external server and stuff, but it's just uh -huh. there's just so many files and maps. It's just really hard to count them all. So that's so funny. In that range, I would say that's that's that is quite a lot of Subaru. So you could say you have just a little bit of experience, and you kind of know what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, you can say I'm getting I'm getting up there in age too. You know, this uh, Asian don't raisin, but you know, it's uh, yeah, wow. I've been doing it a while. So uh, you getting up in age? Like, I don't see a single gray hair on your face. I can see them right now from the corner of my. They're everywhere on my head. Oh uh, yeah, well, Asian, you know, <laughs> stay young for a while. Then once I start getting wrinkles, I'm definitely getting Botox. So. Oof. <laughs> wow. Yeah. My, uh, my sister-in-law, I think she kind of did it, but like some, if this is, has nothing to do with tuning, but I guess if you do it where you can't really tell, like I would have no idea, but don't, yeah. don't go crazy like Joan Rivers. No, no. It's, it's mainly a joke, but I don't think I have to worry about it for a while, but we'll see. Yeah. But, um, I have been doing it a while. Uh, you know, it's been a roller coaster ride. I really started off doing something completely different. Uh, I was in the military for a while and I wanted to go like civil service and, uh, you know, I tailored one of my college degrees around it and then I got into engineering and then I was just like tuning as like a side gig, like a side hustle. I was like, I'll do this for a while while I'm in school. You know, I finished, get my degree, you know, I'm going to go get a real job, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, it was actually the downturn, like a big recession when I got done with school, like 2009, 2010, I think. Uh, we had that big like recession era. Yeah. Really no job. So I was just mm -hmm. like, oh, crap. I like applied everywhere. I couldn't find anything like any jobs that were decent anywhere. Uh, but, you know, I had like four or five job offers to be, you know, their lead EFI tuner at a few different shops. So I didn't even walk on my graduation. I actually packed up, moved to South Florida to go to my first shop. Wow. That's I, I remember that exact time because I was a contractor and I got laid off and yeah, I worked awesome. in IT and I, I couldn't find a job. And for three months, I I worked at a Fry's Electronics for $8 an hour, and all they had me do all day was um, they used to have the racetrack in the middle, and I used to just I literally, I flew helicopters all day. That's all I did because, like, my boss knew where I came from, and he's like, There's nothing you could do here that is worth of anything. Do you want to just hang out? And I'm like, Okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it, sounds good. yeah it wasn't bad, but it, $8 an hour wasn't cutting it. Yeah, but that's more than it is now. So. Oh, yeah. I'm so. I want to touch on this real quick. You said engineering degree, and that's interesting. So what kind of engineering? Mechanical. Just Mechanical. Like yeah. Okay. Because that was the, the question that I had with Graham because he was, uh, it was electrical engineering for him. And then it turned into like, oh, well, is there like a, a lot of crossover between electrical engineering and, and that? And it just became this whole thing. So mechanical engineering. So, 
Yeah, I mean, not really. I mean, I would say 40% of tuners nowadays don't have a degree that's associated. And the degree really doesn't help you that much in terms of tuning, to be quite honest. I mean, some of the basic core fundamentals and formulas you can understand a little easier. Uh, but I don't necessarily think a engineering degree is required or necessary to be a tuner. Um, you're either one of those people that, you know, you see the logs, you see how the car is behaving and performing, and you either get it theoretically and like, oh, I can make this change and get this thing to work, or you don't. And no mm -hmm. degree can change that. You know, it's the, yeah. just that internal process that you that outside of the box thinking, like what, what we were talking about before, a, a theoretical big picture thinking, which an engineer needs to have in general. Like you just need to have that kind of mind. Oh, my dog so <laughs> <laughs> so this con this since the 22 has come out there's been constant conversation constant con uh controversy well which engine is better all oh, the new engine is better maybe it's not so i wanted to ask you you've teamed with all these subarus how are your feelings of the fa24 so far uh i mean it's it's an upgrade in almost every stretch of the imagination um i haven't really found any downsides to the engine yet as of yet um in comparison sorry in comparison to, to the fa20 mm. so uh yeah i mean how do they compare honestly they don't they're in different leagues uh the fa24 is substantially better in almost every way uh, i know i'm going to piss off a lot of my customers with fa20 but i mean the truth is what it is i mean the fa24 you know, it, it's it's an evolution of the FA20. You know, they took a lot of what they didn't like about the FA20 and they really spent some time engineering and fixed it. Um, so the FA24 is the end result of all that. Mm -hmm. So this is something that came up and I was actually talking to a couple of my friends about this, that you see like a lot of uh, German cars, some of these other, other cars that are coming with just two liter turbos, right? And mm -hmm. we had a two liter turbo and we saw what the result of it was and they were like, oh, well, you know, how, why is the Subaru couldn't do that with a two liter? Oh, they had to go 400 cc more? Uh, so it's a different style engine, you know, uh, being a boxer engine definitely has its own personality and its own quirks about it. Um, and one of the biggest things is a lot of the German uh, four cylinders that run massive amounts of boost, they're basically closed deck from the factory, you know, uh, their piston speeds, you know, definitely usually a lot lower. Um, and they're just built from the factory to do and have a different theory of operation, I would say. So it's really apples to oranges. You can't really say one way or another. And just because the B58 makes, you know, six, 700 horsepower, horsepower, <laughs> 800 horsepower, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's whatever's in front of you and how that engine's designed and, it, it's it's just so different on every level. It's just hard to, you know, put it into words, though. But I'm glad that you at least did because I have a lot. So I, I'm part of a couple of car groups here in St. Louis. And I, let me tell you, the amount of Volkswagen people that I have to hang out with. And it was always, these kind of questions always come up. Well, we've been doing it for so long. It's like, all right, calm down. It's just a super that we finally made it. Yeah. And, you know, those engines are impressive. Um, but yeah, they are, I would say they're probably internally built a little bit better, especially some of the newer stuff. Um, but you know, it's just a different design. They have a different goal in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it's always comes down to apples and oranges, you know, argument it's, uh, you know, they did a horizontally opposed engine. I'm sure it would not be as good as Subaru's and if Subaru did an inline engine, it would not be as good as theirs. Yeah. So that, um, just, man, I just like. None of these are actually questions I'm asking that I wanted to ask. It's just like as I'm talking to you, like these different things are coming to mind. But I'm, I, there was a question I wanted to ask, but I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, so what I did was I actually took a lot of questions, a few questions from the comments from the last Tuner talk. And I wanted to actually do, I wanted to say the names of the people who actually asked them as well. So some of these names are really funny and we're going to try to be professional about it. So. Sure. If you're ready, I'll start with the first question. And uh, this individual actually had uh, two questions, two pretty good, uh, two pretty good questions. And th this is actually something people have asked. Um, this is Smut Peddler. <laughs> he his first question was about 
the break-in period, this 1K break-in period and having to do your oil change at 1K. And some people even say do your transmission and differential at that 1K period. What are your thoughts about that break-in period? Um, newer engines, the tolerances are a lot better in a mass production vehicle. I would say the 1K break-in period's almost unnecessary. I would agree that I would like to get the oil out mass produced or not by 500 to 750 okay. miles, maybe buy a thousand at the latest, just for any loose material that might be in there, just to get it out of the, you know, the oil system. You don't want to obviously keep it in there. Uh, in terms of ring seal, I, I honestly think these cars are sealed when they come off the truck. So mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, the, the old philosophy of like, you know, hard bedding rings and such, I, I think they're, they're pretty much bedded in from the factory. Uh, Subaru's always had a habit of running rings pretty tight as well. So now would you apply that to just FA24 or FA20 as well? Uh, I would say both. Yeah. Okay. Um, honestly, I've never completed a break-in on any of my vehicles, uh, even ones that I've done a lot of inappropriate things to, and they've just always <laughs> ran in and they still run. I think at my series grades out there, it was like 80,000 miles, and it was tuned at 50 miles. It was on flex fuel by 150 miles. Um, and, you know, it's I think it's like 70 or 80 hard, you know, 1,000 miles. I still uh -huh. got like 1,000 or something. Um, and, you know, that thing still runs like a top. You know, the, the, I think it's on its like second or third owner since me. And he hit me up the other day. He's like, look, this flex team is still good. Do I need to do anything? I'm like, oh, 400 wheels, leave it alone. That's, that is amazing because and everybody has their own opinion on it, right? Because the dealer will tell yeah, you one thing, tuners will tell you something else. Yeah, and like, you know, my take is a, a few vehicles that I've had. But, you know, I, I see a lot of, especially mass-produced vehicles, which they were really with zero break-in. And they, they do absolutely fine. Okay. And this is uh, related, but... Um, I've seen some videos of Subarus getting built and they run, not only do they run the engines before they go in the car, they then put the, the cars on dynos before they each one. So it was always a question that like, well, if, if it didn't blow up at the engine, why, why am I going to have issues outside? But I do understand the oil part. Yeah. So the oil part is there. And I do think when they do the initial dynamometer testing with them, they are actually indeed sealing the rings for the customer. So if the okay. customer gets in and beats the crap out of a car or goes to start it up and it starts smoking because the ring seal isn't completed yet, it's a bad look for Subaru. So I would say that, that process is probably very regimented to get a very good seal uh, on the mm -hmm. ring to the wall. Now, this is for engine oil. Like, does this also apply to the transmission fluids and the differential oil? I think that's a little excessive. Uh, if you ever look at any type of diff or trans fluid, there's always going to be a little bit of material in there. Uh, and it's pretty normal uh, just by nature of differentials and, you know, um, the transmission itself. So I wouldn't personally touch it until probably it depends. So if you want a better fluid in there, not the OEM fluid, yeah, change it mm -hmm. 10,000 miles. Uh, if you're not one for really caring, uh, you know, to put synthetic everything and you're like an Am yeah, your buddy's an Amsoy dealer, you know, yeah, you can change it early if you want. But I don't see a reason to really do it to 20 or 30,000 miles because, you know, we have like uh, three R&D vehicles currently for the 22 platform. Uh, they all get their butt whipped, to put it politely. <laughs> we are definitely pushing the limits of driveline and pretty much everything. And the only thing we've actually, that's actually succumbed to our stupid ideas was the clutch. Yeah. Uh, to be expected. But that, you know, this, the OEM clutch did hold on to, I think, like 50 to 75 11 second runs. Wow. Um, you know, mid 11 second runs, and it just, it just kept putting up with it. And then eventually we took it to a track and obviously uh, the people took it out. So that's good. That's good to know because I, I do some uh, amateur testing of my own, but definitely not that many in a row. <laughs> that's good yeah. I mean, it was over the course, you know, a couple hits, test passes here, uh, we'll go fun stuff and we'll do another one here. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, they added up and uh, you know, supposedly the transmission is a little bit stronger and, so far, it, it could be a combination of maybe the tensile strength of the gears are a little bit stronger, mm -hmm. but it could also be the fact that a lot of our test subjects are just very low mileage, right? So yeah, it's like exactly. they haven't had the enduring 40,000 miles of city traffic on it yet. You know, that does make a big difference in yeah. how stuff. So.
That's good because I actually I have another interview that I'm doing later in the week that he he has spoken to some Subaru reps. I'm I'm hoping he gives me some information. He said he was going to try to get some sort of like schematics for the transmission because everybody's been asking because like we've seen the rods, we've seen the engine, the engine lining and everything of the new engine. It looks great. Like it visually, it's better than the 20 but like still nobody has any like nobody's opened a transmission we don't know anything substantial but see super is kind of a one trick pony i would say so if they went in there and they changed the ratios of the gearing they probably did something else too really? uh, that's kind of their their mo you know like you know the early stis had like a, a, an actual physical pump or and then they went to a scraper pump or vice versa uh, you know, when they, whenever they change gear ratios and stuff. So uh, I would not imagine they would build a transmission, you know, kind of almost ground up with different ratios. Mm -hmm. um, as much as it seems the same, because a lot of the, you know, the cable shift technology and everything like that's all the same. I don't think the internals are. Quite... Oh, yeah. Driving it tells you right away that it's a different transmission. Yeah. So, okay. So that was so. Smut Peddler has a, he has a follow-up question, and this is probably unfair to ask you. It's probably unfair to ask anybody uh, this is, what, so far, is there any indication of what would be considered a safe horsepower? Because we've seen it all over the place. We've seen 300, 400. We've seen Mike blow his up to 500 or like 450. What do you think so far? Uh, safe is relative. So... Safe is factory. That's what I'll start oh. out by saying. That's not that's <laughs> just saying here. Safe is factory. Leave it alone if you don't say it. Uh, there is always going to be a, you know, a reduction of reliability whenever you turn the power up. It's just you can't have one without the other, although there's ways to mitigate it. So as of late, um, you know, when I first started making bigger power on these, I was definitely... Uh, I don't want to say I was torque hungry, but I was definitely pushing the drive line a little bit further than probably should have. Uh, no customer maps, obviously. Uh, but lately, I would say relative safe on pump gas, depending on the octane level. So like 93 octane, I would say 330, 340 at the tire is about the new norm yeah. uh, for cars with pretty minimal bolts on. I would say 380 to 400 at the tire on an ethanol blend, like E45, E50, something like that. It's kind of just the new norm of what that engine should be able to take for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, my car has been above 400 since uh, long time, <laughs> since almost day one of the access port. It came on. I had literally zero issues with it. Um, I have made like a lot of, I'm more worried about the drive line than the engine so far, if mm -hmm. that tells you anything. Uh, you know, my, if you ever see any of my E50 tunes, they are not making 450 wheel torque anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we've made upwards of 530, 540 wheel torque on test cars. Uh, but now I actually taper the boost out and I do some ignition timing and ABCS tricks. They actually keep the torque at that 400 range just in case. Right. Uh, but as much as everybody says they want to know, we don't know as tuners. It's only been a few months. We only have, you know, a couple hundred test vehicles out there. So uh, I err on the side of caution. I normally try to hit 400 wheel horsepower with E50 with pretty minimal mods uh, and around the same with torque. Obviously, can the car make more? Yes, but durability. Right. Any car can make more, right, for that should one you. run. Can you or should you? Um, yeah. It's one of those things. But, you know, it's it, it's different. With customer vehicles, obviously, we 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 definitely... We definitely take a step back and think about durability of it more than anything. You know, in our own cars, we're just like, fuck it, just hit plus until it stops. <laughs> you know? And if it breaks, it breaks. We figure out what breaks. But, uh, you know, surprisingly to us, I mean, we've done some dumb stuff to these things and we have not broken anything yet. It's kind of astounding because, you know, this I can't imagine some of the cylinder pressures, especially in like... For instance, one of the Felix performance cars. I mean, we had that thing at like 24, 25 pounds on hit, with like a ridiculous amount of timing. Um, you know, that thing was at like 18 degrees of timing by 5,400 RPM, you know, just all out, everything it could do. And it just did it over and over and over without complaints. Wow. That's, I mean, that's so, still, that that's inspiring that there may be, right? Once you start really seeing what breaks, maybe, maybe that engine is going to be the one thing that lasts. Yeah, I think tune responsibly, not doing dumb stuff like that. I think it's it's hard to say it's going to be safe, but I think in relative terms, 
it's comfortable for the engine to do for prolonged periods of time. Okay. Because the safety is what you said, the work, the relative work, right? Because everybody that's looking at this is looking at it from the lens of a VA, right? And if you remember what the what was safe for a VA was what's looking like a considerably less and inexpensive version of what they had in the VA. Yeah, you know, the VAs, they still do pretty well, though, for a two liter. Uh, I will say, my, you know, a lot of the VAs with full bolt-ons, um, and uh, E60 maps, they, you know, they they tend to make almost 400 wheel horsepower as well. Mm. Uh, I've had some outliers that have made 415, 430, you know, stock turbo with some couple bolt-ons. Um, I will say it's a lot easier to do it on F824, obviously. You know, you can put an intake and an intercooler on this car and make 400 wheel horsepower if yeah. you want, uh, which is just unheard of for almost anything under $50,000. And with a label Subaru on it, that's a very, that's an important part. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, the technology and uh, everything that went in the FA24, I think, I think they just got tired of the bad rap maybe. Uh, and they just overbuilt the crap out of the FA24 and then kept the power low <laughs> just so they survived. Uh, yeah. It's kind of, yes. Cause like the, the initial argument was all the reviews were like, well, it's only three horsepower more, but re in realistically it wasn't just three horsepower more. No, and you know some of that is the way that so every every couple of years SAE will come out and how you have to rate your actual horsepower changes. Um, so you know a lot of times a lot of these cars from like 2005 where they're 300 at the crank would not be 300 at the crank nowadays. So mm -hmm. you know SAE changes a lot of that changes. We are seeing a push towards uh, global manufacturer scaled vehicles being closer to uh, at the tire than the crank. Okay. Good. That is good. So, yeah, so it's not completely out of this world, but I will say they still, even then, they underrated it. Um, I would say on an everyday average dyno, they even bone stock, they make about 270 wheel. Yeah. Uh, on dyno jets and such, it's closer to that 275 mark, almost like clockwork on like Win Pepe. Um, some of the, you know, Mustangs are on the 260s and, you know, 265s and other dynos, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, they are definitely putting out more at the tire uh, than they're rated at the crank. That's, it's, I mean, that's what I've seen. That's what my, mine made 268 to the wheel on the Dynajet. And, you know, comparing that to what they post, it's like 271. I'm like, mm, that math doesn't really add up. That math ain't math, bro. <laughs> it definitely ain't math. All right. Thank you, Smud Peddler, for these fantastic questions. So next we have. Inactive Mughal, and this is, you're not the only person getting this question. Every cop is being hammered. No. Uh -oh. Do you know, or do you have any experience with the CVT so far? Have you guys messed around? Not messed around, but like, have you put her on a dyno? Have you like... I actually, my wife is a fan of WRX. She had like a CVT-18, which... Mm wasn't the best to be honest but it was cool because it drove itself and you know <laughs> uh but yeah we actually bought her a gt uh, oh okay we pre-ordered the uh a gt and when i ordered my premium um so she is actually driving that every day now um and we're basically just waiting on word from cobb that we're gonna get to yeah. uh the last i heard on it from cobb is they are diligently working on it they have a couple test uh test platforms right now but i guess the tcm and PCM are kind of linked in terms of uh, available requested torque. So uh, these cars use like requested torque tables, you know, for mm. power stuff, right? So, you know, a certain amount of requested torque equals as much boost. Well, the problem is, is there's built, uh, there's, uh, well, I'm theorizing that there's internal uh, requested torque limitations through the CVT itself. Uh, so basically what's happening is Cobb is turning it up PCM side and the power is getting to the engine and the CVT sees the additional power and it's past its relative uh, or requested torque safety zone and actually reduce uh, the power. I see. So basically they're adding power and the, the CVT is removing Shutting it down. Okay. Because like if you saw the ascent is out, the, well, they just hit the ascent, just got its own Cobb tuning. So it's possible the WRX may not be that far behind. Yeah, so, and it's something specific to the WRX because we've tuned many ascents okay. and they don't have an issue. Um, you know, you, you can make quite a bit of power through the CVT uh, on the ascents and uh, there's no relative requested torque uh, mitigating through the ECU or the PCM side. So I'm thinking it's potentially something they put in there for the new SPT. I was going to say, maybe that's, maybe the SPT is actually much different than the CVT. Is that maybe a safe assumption? Uh, well, I mean, 
in theory, it is a CVT. There's just no getting around it. A CVT mm -hmm. is a CVT. You know, it's constant velocity or it's not. But I would say the the way that it uh, does power management is completely different than what we've seen before, for sure. Um, the CVT is actually for, I will, mm, let me choose my words carefully. The CVT for a CVT is very impressive. Uh, when you're actually driving the car, the driver feel, uh -huh. it shifts pretty quick. It shifts. It almost feels like uh, my B58 Super did. Interesting. It's just obviously lying. Uh -huh. uh, mimicking these gear shifts uh but you know what's i just expected super even if you had gear changing ability you would hit the paddle and then wait three seconds and then you know right. this thing is like the old the old cvt was more yeah. like that yeah and the old cvt you know you'd hit it and then it'd be like a fake gear change and you could tell it was fake this thing if you go in it and you really flog it through the gears and sport sharp and see what the cvt in manual mode uh, -huh. uh you'd be hard pressed to know it was a cvt the first time you drove it to really? be honest I'm actually I mean, trying to find somebody that has an SPT in St. Louis. So far, I, I haven't because I, I want to experience it. Find a GT, too, because they, they the, the Sport Sharp logic does tighten up the CVT shifts even that much further. Interesting. So. And that's a GT only? I think I could have swore the, the drive mode selection for uh, the transition was GT only. I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. The the, uh, the suspension. I will say a lot of people griped about how much the GT cost. Mm -hmm. And I'll the suspension around is almost worth the cost. This is really, yes, absolutely. Um, because I do, I am on the train of thinking the WX rides pretty firm, it's real bouncy. It uh, is very bouncy. <laughs> oh, there goes my dog. Sorry, it's not my favorite thing to take on a road trip, even when it's in stock form. Uh -huh. uh, we can put that thing in comfort and you know, turn the uh, radar cruise control on, and that thing it, it rides down the road like a BMW. Oh so, man, that's great. That is actually good because I I've been trying to see if I can ask my my friend at my dealership to just let me take one of their GTs out because I there's barely even any VBs in St. Louis. I'm just now starting to find out. That I think there's like two, and one of them actually went to the shop that I went to, and they were telling me about. They're like, yeah, this guy wanted to put a short throw shifter, and then I randomly found him on Facebook. He was like, oh yeah, I went to EcoTech like last week. And I was like, dude. Where have you been? I've been asking for St. Louis VVs for like a month and a half now. So as soon as I get the chance to drive one, I want to experience, especially a day, because I really want to see how much it changes the shocks. Sorry. The dog issues? Yeah, dog issues. <laughs> the wife is at bachelor night. Oh, yeah. So, That's yeah okay. they have They're not uh, bothering us yeah. one bit. I don't hear them at all. Yeah. So that was uh, in inactive mobile, and this I mean the CVT question is gonna until they get the tuning out there, everyone's gonna ask every day about that. Which I mean, it's I understand they see the rest of the manual world enjoying their car. They just want to enjoy their CVT. Yeah, Sorry, and SPT. Yeah, SPT. I mean, it's a CVT at the end of the day. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it sounds like they're close, but you know, I'm not a cop insider, unfortunately. I just yeah. kind of hear grapevine. <laughs> Sometimes we'll call with like a password lockout, and sometimes Marshall will tell us some stuff. And stuff. Oh, well, that's maybe you call for a password reset every day then, until something yeah. slips. Like, yeah, <laughs> uh, well, I got a GT in the garage. <laughs> uh, just make it a long password. All right, so this this is a this is another controversial one. This is something that I get. I made a video about this, and just people went crazy. But I think I think there's an application for everything in life, especially with cars. And the question was. The Cobb OTS tune. People will argue it's garbage. It's this. It's that. There are applications for when, and this is my opinion, that I believe that there's there's an application for when you can go get an e-tune and a pro-tune. But there's there are applications where some person's like, you know what, I'm okay with an OTS tune, and they'll run it for an extended period of time. What is your opinion on that? Uh, my opinion, I thought the Cobb OTS tunes actually when I got into them and they first opened them up were actually pretty damn good. Um, so you have to look at it from an aspect of a lot of people compare my OTS map to Cobb's. Oh, but yeah. I, I don't like that comparison because I'm a much smaller volume. You know, they're putting out a tuning product globally and they're like one of the only ones. They have to put out a moderately safe tune. There's only so much they can really do. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of you know power progression and, and such, uh, I don't see any reason why the Cobb OTS map would would ever hurt an engine. Um, 
And, you know, on the same token, a lot of people are like, oh, well, my dam falls with the Cabo TS map. I'm like, well, that's because it follows more OEM logic. Yeah. OE logic is to pull the dam down no matter what. You can, like, fart in the seat, the dam will drop. Right? <laughs> you know, Cobb still applies that logic mainly because this is a mass market, you know, product that they're giving out to how many different consumers. And, you know, if Cobb sent out a product with, uh, you know, uh, knock sensitivity that was through the moon, you know, they, they'd start breaking cars and, you know, it would just it would just be all double negative bad. Mm -hmm. um, so what we actually did is I actually use uh, audible knock ears. It's like a super ghetto 80s way to do it. Uh, I also use Amplified. Um, and then basically I see at what range this car is making above engine noise and why and what cylinders and how that noise relative uh, to, you know, the knock sensor programming on the stock ECU. Um, so from there, I can build a knock calibration table that's a little bit less sensitive than, say, Cobb's, uh, but still very effective against actual knock. So, but there's a fine line. I've seen a lot out there where they are just throwing so much knock deadening at these cars to where even if they did have some sort of series of large events, the car would never know the better. Wow. Um, so you got to be pretty particularly careful about that aspect, too. Uh, and it's not just like one or two people that I've seen do that. It's, you know, it's probably five, eight different. So people. you're talking like tuners. Tuners are doing this. So. I mean, it's kind of, well, I think the fault came in with the FA20. The FA20 does have a lot more engine noise uh, to be expected. Um, so, you know, there's a, a, a certain deadening of the knock sensor that you would normally do. And the FA24 needs a lot less, um, almost half as much as the FA20 did. Uh, well, maybe not half, maybe 70% as much or something like that, right? So a lot of people were applying FA20 logic to the 24, and you just can't do that. Uh, oh, you know, yeah, the FA24, I mean, the uh, they're not very knock prone. They're just, the FA20 basically lives on the knock sensors. You know, they're just knock happy motors. Uh, the the 2.4 I, I thought was broken for a while because I was like, man, this thing just really never has anything on the knock sensors like ever. Um, but yeah, there are ways that make it angry. Uh, I will say putting an ETS intake without the sleeve. Oh. Or, or ETS, <laughs> uh, Cause not only does it lean it out a little bit, leaning out a little bit on the OTS map isn't a big deal. Cause all the off the shelf maps are actually enclosed with fueling. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah, not a big deal. The, the ECU will correct it based off the front of the shoe sensor. The big deal comes into play is really without seeing that, that math frequency, uh, without the, Without the math frequency there, uh, you know, uh, that's actually missing from the math. Wow, say that six times fast. Uh, basically, you're in a different load cell of your timing map than you would normally be. Uh -huh. So, say you would normally be at like a 26, 27 G rev range on an OTS map with stock intake. Well, now you're down in this 24, 23 G rev range. Uh, and that range also has another eight degrees of ignition timing. So you're basically adding eight degrees of ignition timing or six degrees, whatever figure. Right? Mm -hmm. um, you're adding that ignition timing in addition to being lean in certain areas. So, yeah, the car will run uh, a couple columns, if not three columns to the left of its ignition timing map with an ETS intake on there. So that's why we stress don't do it. Uh, obviously, they came out with a solution, the sleeve, and it does work. We tested the sleeve. Mm -hmm. it works just Okay. Uh, but yeah, when you tune the car, you actually tune the math and scale the math correctly. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up specifically that because the video that I made was when the sleeve came out. And, you know, there's and the reason why I make these videos is because there's we have every time there's a new Subaru that comes out, we have new owners and they don't always get the right information. They'll see somewhere. They'll be like, oh, I saw the website. It should be fine. And originally on ETS's website, it specifically said, dude, with no asterisks no tune required and i remember when i originally saw it i had screenshotted it and i made that video and ecs actually just responded to that video i think a couple of days ago i mean just a long pair which again that's that is their right to do and you know i i told them I said, you know thank you very much for replying my video wasn't meant to like demean you guys but i think it's important to know what is right and what isn't you know but we just want to keep everybody honest. That's all, right? Because on their website, it did say no to, and they did have to go back there later and change it, add some asterisks, add some disclaimers, which I think should have been there from the beginning. But it it did, it caused a rift between people, right? Some people saying, well, ETS said you didn't need it. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, you're going to have situations like that with any early, you know, release 
product, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are always going to be trials and tribulations. Not only that, what we're finding is that math on this car is highly sensitive. So, uh, you know, even a, a minuscule change, uh, you know, it's it's not going to descale uh, by the three or four percent that you would, you know, typically imagine. It descales it exponentially more than we initially had figured. Because uh, when I first started scaling the ETS intake, I was just like, oh, I'll just add a few percent, see what happens. And I was like, oh, I got to add a lot of percent. I was like, well, I got to add a lot. <laughs> Holy crap, this math is no joke. Well, uh, good. I'm glad. Well, ETS, if you're watching this video, I don't know why you would. Please, I don't hate you. I like you. I just, you know, I, it's for informational purposes only. I think it's important for everybody to know the right information. That is that is yeah. it. So please send me. But now we got that out of the way. I do think this <laughs> probably has some of the best products on the market. Yes, exactly. bar none. My base, my car is a rolling ETS catalog. So, <laughs> and uh, I'd say most cars right now, twenty twos, they are right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All right. So we're not gonna talk with you. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So the next question comes from Austin Powers, spelled P O A U R S. Hmm. Power. <laughs> Austin Powers. So he Austin Powers asked, this is a very similar thing to the ETS intake. I don't know why this ended up being was what happened with the Turbo Smart blow off valve. A lot of people were putting them out without the tune. They were finding just all kinds of issues. So his question was, it was that an outlier, or is this just in general, should I have that on there? Because right now my car is running rich between shifts. So <sighs> I will say I don't, you'll almost never catch me online saying anything bad anyways, but I will say with the select pool that I've had so far, to put it politely, I don't recommend any bypass valve or blow off valve that's currently offered on the market. Okay. Um, a lot of them do have issues. They draw open, uh, you know, even the ones that are, you know, uh, they're just kind of inserts. Mm -hmm. I've tried different closing, you know, closing rates and press, everything I could do electronically to get them to cooperate. And I just got to the point where it's just like, why do I have to make this many changes to the electronic blow off valve just to get this thing to somewhat work? Uh -huh. Just don't put it on. Interesting. <laughs> don't put it on. Don't have the issues. Now, are they all electronic? All these new yeah. blow valves are electronic? Yeah. So they're all electronic, electronic blow off valve, wastegate. Uh, so yeah, there's certain things you can change, you know, you can change like when, when it actually opens, you know, it's relative to your throttle position mm -hmm. and such. Uh, but I've just not had any good luck with any okay. of them. Um, and I don't want to say too much, but even certain co co companies have been fighting me on this forever. Mm -hmm. so their stuff doesn't leak. And time and time again, I've just watched it leak grossly uh, okay. during tuning and such. So uh, yeah, I mean, just like the older FA20s, there was probably two bypass valves that worked, the Cobb SF and or the Cobb LF, and then probably the Grim, newer Grim Speed seems to be holding up pretty well. Mm -hmm. That was about it. Um, so you got to figure your, your your pool of aftermarket selection right now is kind of limited. Yeah. Uh, and they, I would say they rushed some of these products out. So uh, the simple and political answer is uh, I don't recommend any at this point. So... Because like the reason why people would want them, they want that. So yeah. the alternative for them would be to just get an intake. Yeah, because your induction sound, you're gonna get that sound, yeah. right? That's really I my expect. That's what I think. I don't think a lot of people get them for whatever reason you would have next. They want. Yeah. And you'll get plenty of with an intake. An intake. So that solves that problem. So basically, don't get it. Just get an intake. Get a two from Truck Me Two. Easy. That's all. Yeah. That solves Austin Powers. So basically, the answer to Austin Powers: is Please go to take it off. Get yeah. a take. <laughs> that's good. I'm glad that's okay. So now we've got Spencer Richards, which is the most normal name on this list. But this is actually a really good question because we talked last time we talked about uh, how the new turbo is actually a Garrett turbo. It's a little. It's got a little bit of bigger hot side. I think that was the answer. But he wanted to know. His question was. Can you high flow the hot side of the turbo to get a little more size out of it? Can you high flow? Like port it? Possibly. I don't want to change his question, but that's that's how his question was worded. Um, because they're thinking that the turbo is going to be the limiting factor for power on this engine right now. Absolutely. 
So I don't know. I'm sure I would say relatively probably Boost Lab would be my guess. It's probably already got one of those turbos apart and they're trying to figure out a way to put a bigger wheel in it. I doubt they would do just the exhaust housing mm -hmm. or the exhaust turbine. They would probably do the inlet one as well. Um, but yes, you probably, it's just like any other turbo. Mm -hmm. So I don't see Make why. a little bit bigger. Maybe he's asking, I, the, without any context, my expect, uh, what I think is like Mr. Richards wants to take his turbo apart at home and do some DIY. Yeah, that'd be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, unless you're real versed in turbo porting, but I'll be honest, like the, the big turbo porting thing that happened in like, 2008 to 2012 really kind of ended badly a lot of people weren't getting much gains from it and a lot of people were having like wastegate issues because the flapper wasn't sealing mm -hmm. or you know they're having like lower boost issues uh the net the net gain from the the negatives really didn't outweigh each other too much uh so that's why you don't even really see ported turbos that much anymore okay. you know you, you can do it as an option you know the port the hot side it helps a little bit but I don't think it helps as much as most people probably think. So the alternative would be to just wait for a, a slightly larger aftermarket turbo to just replace the whole unit. And that's the obvious, the obvious choice, you know, taking that turbo off and doing all that stuff. It is a big pain in the butt, you know, just to not do anything. We have a guest on the show. <laughs> You'll have to ask him some questions. <laughs> I bet his hot side does not need any porting. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't. He's straight pipe, bro. Yeah. Oh. Constant forks. He's uh, venting to atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. So that's actually that's actually all the questions from um, the the comment section, and I think I think we covered like quite a lot of like it was a spread, it was all over the place. But I think it was it's good questions that I have seen time and time again asked on Facebook, on Reddit, just pretty much everywhere I look. My damn comment section now has them as well. Like it's I mean. What what are sir like? Is there any wisdom that you can impart on us today about what to do or where we're going with FA twenty four? Anything at all? Um, what wisdom would I have? Let's say somebody's. I guess another question comes. Somebody asked me, "Oh, I just got this car last week. I want mm -hmm. to start tuning. What is your first recommended?" path uh, uh so yeah definitely an intake and then from there a top mount um and then from there really j pipes you know i've i've tied this a long time and i've had a lot of other tuners disagree with me and even kind of talk down about the subject but i just don't i'm not never been on board with the fa's make more power with a j pipe than an intake I would much rather put an intake on one of these. If I had a choice of one or the other, it would absolutely be an intake. I just think they they do better with intakes. Uh, plus, you get some cool noises. But they they uh, you know we we put this up to the test too. We actually put two twenty twos on the dyno. Uh, both were stopped. We put there was a turbo back on one of them. Uh, so we tuned that car first, and then we tuned another car with just an intake. And the intake car definitely had a much broader power band, and uh, as well as making another 12 volt horsepower. So it's a pretty small sample pool, but we just say. did it to see uh, because I've always had that argument that the J pipe nowadays, you know, with some of the newer technology on these cats, it's just not as restrictive as it once was, and like their older EJ counterparts, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think catalyst technology has come a long way. Uh, and that's what's allowing some of these newer cars to produce all these astounding power figures as well. Um, you know, this isn't like, you know, the crappy old cats from the 2004 STI where it just clogs. If you look, these cats are made to to survive 80,000 uh, 80, uh, miles of, of abuse on these cars. So. I'm glad that you said that because that is a sentiment that has been echoed by a couple of other people that I've talked to that, especially now, that the intake is getting way more gains than the J-Pipe. Yeah, and, for part for part. And I actually carried that logic from an FA20, believe it or not. So usually when people ask me for an FA20 mod guide, I'd say the very first thing should always be an intercooler because they're very knock happy and they absolutely hate uh warm boost air temp. Interesting. And then from there an intake mm -hmm. and then a boost controller. Uh and then from there, once you do all those things, then you look into either ethanol blend mapping or a J pipe at that point. So uh, J-Pipe's always been last on the list, not because uh -huh. it's an EPA thing. It's just because it's, 
you know, they're fucking expensive. They're like thirteen hundred dollars, especially now. So, you know, you can make four hundred wheel with an intake and a top mount. Do you that's... need a thirteen hundred dollars on a J pipe that nets you another, you know, five to eight wheel horsepower, maybe ten, all said and done on pump gas. Uh, you know, I'll net you a little bit more on E50 or, you know, an ethanol blend map. But again, you know, the $1,300 in the VB can go very far uh, in other areas. That's, I'm, I'm, I wanted to originally ask that as a question for myself, because that's all I have right now on it is an intake and an E40 blend. And I mean, it's, it's making like 362 and it's on, on E40. And I, it's crazy that it's just an intake and, and gas. I do eventually want the J-Pipe for a little bit added sound, but I mean, I'm Actually, happy with it. Definitely do a top mount as your next step. Mm -hmm. When these cars get warm, that, that top mount starts getting that 140 area. Uh, they do get a little knock happy. There's a curtain, certain points of the, of the VV that I've noticed it does not like. Uh, one of them is a very spicy boost air temp. Uh, so a lot of the, like some more test cars that are turned up way too much in fourth gear when we we're on a top mount, uh, you know, they were touching 140 plus degrees at 40 degree ambient temperature, even with an ETS top mount. Oh, Obviously, wow. had and those cars didn't really like, appreciate it too much. So, um, yeah, obviously there was a lot of IT compensations that went into all these cars with top mounts. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, just to be able to reduce those IT comp compensations with the front mount air cooler, it absolutely do does merit the cost. So a lot of people are like, ah, oh, top mount's good enough. Well, it's not. Uh, if you're on A50 and, you know, especially if you're in a hot climate, it is worth it to get the front mount. So, oh, okay. All right. There is a price variation, but I, I would absolutely i think the price because like ets is the only one i've seen the price is not the issue it's that piping that yeah. piping is about 800 bucks so the the, it, the core itself is like i think also like 895 or like 795 which is for a front mount that's actually a really good price yeah see i don't really know because i get discounts wow <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how much stuff costs i'll be honest uh, uh i think it's more it's probably what five or six hundred more if i had a guess yeah uh, but yeah, I would say it's probably definitely worth it. Um, I recently, I, I took the top mount as far as I could uh, in terms of R&D and stuff. Uh, and I really stretched the legs on the top mount. And I did find a kind of a stopping point even on the stock turbo where I wouldn't feel comfortable, you know, that car that turned up on, on even on E50 uh, when it was hot out. So yeah, once I got to that point, yeah, I'm a friend. And good. I'm, I'm that is really good wisdom, actually. That's that's very good good because like people ask like which which do you go do you go do you wait till you're like chin your turbos or do you just do it now because I, mean, I think even the cool factor i've i've never had a car with a front mount i've always wanted so maybe this is maybe this is the time yeah it's your nudge i mean uh the, the front mount does outperform the top mount uh i will say and we did a test recently between the ets ets top mount and the cob top mount we found no negligible difference mm -hmm. uh, i think the cobs like I forgot what they call it. I just had a cob on my car recently before I took it off for the front mount. They're they're basically hood scoop. They they have a certain name for it. Uh, I think it did maybe provide a couple more degrees uh, lower ambient cruising around town. Mm. Uh, but in any case, between the ETS and the cob, uh, the temperature rise was pretty much identical. Uh, wide open throttle, and as soon as you get any type of airflow moving to the intercooler, they both perform so well. It's just mm -hmm. negligible. Very good. That's also good to know. Because I don't think there's a price difference between the two, are there? I think the cob might be a touch more, but you do get that weird little tunnel ram. Oh there. yeah. The to the God, what do they call it? There's a name for it, it just I forgot what it's uh, called. Something thrust tunnel, maybe? Yeah, I I know exactly what you're talking about, and I get, the name escapes me as well. It's it's they <laughs> all they all made it when they had it for the FA. It was very specific duct. Yeah, I think thrust ducting or thrust tunnel or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I was a little, and they sent that weird little coupler for the uh, charge pipe. And I was like, why the hell did they do this? I was like, this thing is never coming off, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. And then we took it apart and I was looking inside and I was like, oh, that's why they did it. I think it tapers down to like almost nothing. This was the, you're talking the coupler for the... Thrust, they call it a thrust coupler. It goes on the charge pipe. Okay. Uh, if you take the stock one off, it, it does actually restrict quite a bit of air. I see. So, yeah, it does look like Cobb, you know, they did their homework, like all their products, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're pretty well engineered and pretty well thought. So, well, that's that's really good information. I have one last question for you, and this is probably the most controversial one, and I get it all the time. I actually, just made the, my last video I talked about it is Are you team painted fenders or team honeycomb? Honeycomb I, would be not painted, obviously. Yeah, I used to be. 
team painted fenders when they first came out to be uh, honest uh but not anymore i'm team honeycomb now i absolutely love them uh i can like because we have a gravel parking lot where the shops oh are. yeah and i can just blast through that parking lot don't worry about rock chips uh plus I, I just like the way it looks aesthetically it's pleasing to me now you know it it really didn't take long for the bb to grow on me i mean mm. it was probably been a week i started enjoying the plastic fenders once i put some wheels on it and lowered it i was like this yeah like it just looks great um but you know i've always been kind of the more utilitarian type of with my vehicles like you know i always thought those outback like the older outback the green like wagons were cool yeah so yeah maybe i just got weird taste but i definitely no you don't there's that we're going to be talking about this for the next five to seven years that this car is out god knows what they're going to do after it how much class is going to go off paint the fenders on those things and they uh you paint the fenders on them and you don't do much else they look like shit to me personally they because you still see the contour that's my issue when you paint it the contour is still there like you didn't they didn't disappear it does look like a corolla when you paint the fenders to me it just looks way less aggressive and it just, mm -hmm. just doesn't i mean yeah like the aeroflow dynamics car mm -hmm. it looks phenomenal but you know they painted the fenders and did everything else yeah I think when you do that and everything else it looks great but otherwise i think if you're just gonna rock a set of wheels and maybe lower it and do like you know the sti lip kit i think it looks the best with the fenders unpainted for sure wow we're learning a lot today there's gonna be there's gonna be some people who are gonna say some things but i think that's the great thing about the car community it's okay if you want to it's there if you don't save yourself some money buy a top belt <laughs> or front mount, you know, because it's like yeah. two grand to paint those things. It's not cheap. Yeah, that alone see. keeps me from painting them. But I mean, you know, whatever floats your boat. It's your car. Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Anyway, that's that's everything I've got. Um, Andy, that was an incredible amount of information, and you know, I thank you again so much. I will definitely have um, your website posted down below, but I really don't think there's any any need for an introduction from you especially in the groups where people know you uh actually with the video that i did about the uh the dino tunes uh you're some of your i did throw some of your numbers in there and actually the one that you were talking about where you had the uh the j pipe and you think i think i do have that that graph oh, somewhere yeah. and there was another one that uh, melanie posted where it was like uh stock ots and then 93 and then an e40 map and i was like look at this this is amazing look at what we can do with this car you know so like i definitely alluded to some of the stuff that you've done as a as an indication for other people who weren't fully aware of, of what's capable with just like some basic bolt-ons yeah i appreciate it yeah uh especially melanie and they were just really passionate about the 22 they just absolutely fell in love with them and they're just like well let's just test them nobody's done it let's just mm -hmm. see what they do <laughs> So she's uh yeah she's definitely been out front on the on the twenty two stuff oh uh, yeah a lot of stuff so he's been very helpful a lot of people have just nothing but good things to say both about Felix and of you as well so again Andy thank you so much for joining me um, I hope you guys learned something there was a lot of information here so until <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah no this is this is what everybody wanted the people when I made the other video people were like don't you make a short tuner talk don't make a short one i want all of it just let him talk and i was like okay all right i will uh so anyway we'll see you guys in the next episode hopefully we'll see who comes up next i hope you guys enjoy this thanks so much see you guys